Welcome back. My name is Patrick McMullen. Uh, I am the uh, Director of Computational Toxicology at Cytovation, and I will be your host for the, uh, the third session uh, uh, today uh, on our, our dialogues. Uh, this, this dialogue is on decision-making for climate change in, in health. Uh, format will be very similar to, uh, for, for those of you who have, have been with us the whole day that, that you've seen uh, uh, throughout, the, throughout the afternoon here. We, uh, we, we have a, a great panel of, 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 of experts from, from diverse areas that are here to share with us their, their insights about where they see environmental health science going and where uh, we can expect it to interact with the prevailing issue of climate change over the next 10 years. Uh, so to, to begin, we're going to have each of our panelists uh, take about five minutes to discuss uh, who they are, uh, what their perspective is on the issue, and kind of set up their uh, their history and their, their thoughts on the, uh, the, the workshop uh, thus far and kind of where we're going in environmental health science in the next 10 years. Uh, and then we're going to turn to a, a dialogue. Uh, on a scenario-based session that uh, focuses on uh, addressing global health uh, challenges, uh, uh, in, in particular climate change. So, uh, just like the other sessions, uh, we we certainly invite you to uh, to participate uh, in the uh, under the video viewer in the in the event page. You will see a uh, a dialogue box that uh, lets you uh, submit questions via a platform called Slido. Uh, please do that, and our uh, our staff is is moderating those, and we'll uh, we'll, we'll pass them our, our way for for discussion. So, with that, um, I I want to uh, introduce our, our first uh, first panelist, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Karen Bailey. Uh, 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 we'll, we'll start us off for this session. Uh, Dr. Dr. Bailey is from the Environmental Studies Program at University of Colorado Boulder, uh, and I will pass the conch to her uh, as she will explain a bit more about her perspective on the future of environmental health sciences. So, Dr. Bailey, the, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you so much um, for having me today. I'm so eager and excited to be able to participate in this in this panel and this broader discussion on sort of the future of all the work that we're thinking about and doing in, in the realm broadly defined as environmental health. So a bit about me, I am a social scientist who really shifted from being kind of a purely ecological scientist and environmental scientist um, after doing some work in Southern Africa uh, and studying uh, in the ecological systems and wildlife uh, in landscapes where, that were explicitly and really profoundly experiencing the brunt of climate change on their livelihoods, their health, and their well-being. Um, and so it was that during that time, my dissertation about 10 years ago, where I was struck by my broader interest in human environment interactions kind of broadly defined in the context of climate change and global, global change more broadly defined. Um, and so I decided to have a challenging decision to shift from being an ecologist where the majority of my training had been up to that point to being a social scientist. And that, that shift um, it really drives a lot of my on what I hope for in terms of the future of environmental health in the context of climate change. So a lot of my experience in this topic does come from working with communities in low and middle income settings, living in rural areas, directly feeling the impacts of climate change on health, well-being, livelihoods, and relationships with the environment. Um, and so thinking about the future of climate change and environmental health, a few, a few key themes came to mind when I was preparing for today. Um, so my thinking is that when we can create enabling conditions to achieve these themes, um, we'll be closer to the goal of kind of addressing environmental health under a changing climate. So the first theme is sort of broadly intersectionality and interdisciplinarity. Really, I think we've seen, and I think a lot of people have discussed throughout the, the different um, uh, panels and talks today, that the siloing of disciplines and the siloing of societal problems and the separation of societal problems and environmental problems and justice issues um, and as so many other intersectional and inherently intersectional issues um, has led to strategies for solving problems that sometimes have exacerbated them or led to increased marginalization and inequitable outcomes as a result of those strategies. Um, so when we're thinking about um, where we should be going, strategies uh, that are aimed at conserving nature, that have 
uh, in the past, for example, led to exclusion or of other ways or no, of knowing or disconnection of our relationship with the environment. Um, these are the sort of, this is the history of the way we've been thinking about environmental challenges and addressing the issues of climate change that we need to move past. Um, and so when we don't think about this intersectional components, we run the risk of making things worse. So this first, first theme of intersectionality and inter interdisciplinarity really highlights the need to bring scholars from across disciplines together to solve problems and consider, consider them in ways that are inherently intersectional. And when I use the word intersectional, I am intentionally sort of thinking of the work of Kimberly, Kimberly Crenshaw, who uh, coined the term the, the critical feminist scholar um, and, and critical theorist, and also said, when they enter, we all enter. Um, when we solve problems for the most vulnerable and excluded, uh, uh, marginalized among us, among us, really we all win. So the third strategy, and I think, or sorry, the second theme is, uh, is, is this idea of humanity. Uh, and, I, and I think about this in the context of sort of a, a life scientist, trained as a life scientist, um, and studying environmental challenges in ecology. And so part, and, and really seeing that I wasn't represented in those fields and my communities and their, their uh, relationships with the environment weren't represented in those fields. And I think part of the reason the fields of environment, environmental health, and climate research, at least in the U.S. context, uh, really struggle with issues related to equity and inclusion and justice is because we have excluded ourselves, our humanity, our values, our communities in our work. Um, I often cite some work that was recently published by, uh, I believe it was Hop et al. in 2019, um, that showed that Black scientists were 20% less likely to receive funding from the National Institutes of Health than white scientists. And this is something that people have been talking about for a, a while, but it's a trend that persists. And the gap is largely explained by the types of research questions pursued. Um, at least in this particular sample, Black scientists were more likely to propose research focused on people, communities, populations, interventions, rather than biological and physiological processes on their own. Seeing humanity in their research, they sought to understand health disparities, patient-focused interventions. Um, and consistently, as unfortunately, Panelists viewed this research as less impactful and less worthy of funding, leading to this 20% discrepancy in, in, um, in funding success. And so we really need to advance research that sees people and community and our humanity in our science if we want to address these environmental health challenges. And the last theme, and I'll wrap up here, is this idea of, I think, restoration and healing. Um, I currently have a student who's looking at the links between critical theories like feminist theory, indigenous thought and theory, restorative justice, and environmental work. And it's highlighting the need for healing in the fields of environmental health and climate change uh, research. Um, while not leaning too heavily into the language of victim and perpetrator, we can't really think about how to solve problems of the future, how to allocate resources, how to get everyone to the table, how to solve the problems without thinking about how to heal past injustices and restore relationships as we bring those people to the table. So looking ahead, um, my hope is that we do better with considering all the voices and thinking about intersectionality, humanity, and restoration and healing. And that's sort of how I approach this work. So I'll pause there a little over time. Wonderful. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Bailey. I, I think that was a, a beautiful, beautiful setup for, for, for our discussion. I think that uh, a, a prevailing theme through this workshop so far has been the, uh, the, the complexity of looking at the intersection between uh, between exposures and, as, as you put it, uh, humanity uh, and some of these uh, uh, environmental justice and vulnerability considerations. Uh, so I think that that's a, a great a great way to set up uh, our, uh, our discussion. So. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Uh, Christine Johnson. Uh, and uh, Dr. Johnson, I think your slides are in uh, presenter view. So if you could if you could just switch that, I think it would be helpful. Uh, and while she's doing that, Dr. Dr. Johnson is a professor of uh, epidemiology and ecosystem health and the director of the Epicenter uh, for for Disease Dynamics at the at the One Health Institute. Um, so we're, we're looking forward to uh, getting her perspective. One, One Health has has come up a, a number of times uh, uh, already uh, in this in this workshop as as a way to kind of reframe the way we think about environmental health science. Um, and uh, and and uh, I've been I've been looking forward to uh, to hearing hearing her perspective uh, uh, all day long. So uh, with that, uh, Dr. Dr. Johnson, I'm, I'll, I'll turn the turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much. 
Dr. McMillan, is that, is that a better view for the slides? It's perfect. That's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm really excited to be on this panel, especially after the opening remarks from, uh, from Dr. Bailey just now. Um, so I'm an infectious disease epidemi epidemiologist. I've, I've worked largely on infectious diseases. I have also worked on some non-infectious diseases, specifically focusing on wildlife as sentinels for environmental change. Um, and so I wanted to be um, a little bit more um, sharing of my perspective um, and how I think about emerging trends and future casting for patterns around health outcomes that we're concerned about. Specifically, I wanted to highlight how I think about environmental risk at some of the broadest global scales um, using the special case of emerging infectious diseases. Um, when we think about forecasting future risk, we generally look at the past trends, which can definitely shed light on the drivers of those trends. And um, here I'm showing a list of novel viruses that have emerged since 1912. Um, and it's worth noting just briefly that wild animals were the most likely source, um, original source for just about all of these. Um, and also worth noting that all but the Spanish flu um, have occurred since the 1950s. And that, um, if you look to the, the figure on the right from our world in data, corresponds very closely to massive gains in global population growth, which um, along with industrialization, which I think very closely parallels accumulation of environmental hazards and the way we tend to think about environmental health traditionally, um, which is linked to industrialization and a lot of the process that came along with that. So we also similarly suspect that emerging infectious diseases is related to major environmental uh, change on the global scale, especially our ability to alter the landscape and that that increases opportunities for new animal-human interactions. And so we think about emerging infectious diseases um, as a result of landscape change for agriculture and development primarily, also social and economic inequalities, especially where, where uh, pathogens first emerge and affect um, local communities, um, as well as trade and travel, and, and most recently um, thinking about this in terms of climate change. And so underlying all of these trends is, um, is, is sort of this idea behind large scale environmental change, which oftentimes starts with deforestation and habitat loss, loss of native habitat, especially for wildlife species and wildlife species that then need to move around. Um, they may be reservoirs for infectious diseases and as they find new suitable habitat, um, and invariably that increases opportunities for animal human contact, including um, contact with vectors. So, um, so that's sort of the underpinning and, and sort of the, the traditional thinking that we have around infectious diseases, but it's important now to bring that um, towards climate change, which we think of just as another impending driver of ecological change. Um, some of which we're already starting to witness um, events around how that will affect infectious disease in particular, um, but a lot remain to be seen um, and, and understood. And we really need to work on an evidence base to tie in disease outcomes to environmental change at the local scale. These broad patterns only get you so far. Um, we really need to think about how these, how these infectious diseases are directly tied to the local change that's occurring. And this means close integration of animal, human, and environmental health and research efforts. We also want to highlight um, here that the points of entry to mitigate the frequency of emerging infectious diseases are going to be primarily in this pre-emergence and um, early emergence phase, especially if we want to minimize the impact of emerging infectious pathogens. Um, and so that's really what drives my perspective around what's needed in the future. And so um, to do this, we're going to need to capitalize on some of the technical innovations that actually that we heard about a lot this morning in terms of precision medicine and that field and how we can apply um, that, that detection of, of trends and patterns um, early on to the landscape specifically. Um, so for improved and in, in, in early detection, ideally of these emerging th and threats. Currently right now, we rely on clusters of basically severe disease in people. Um, that's really what gets noticed, unusual illness. Um, of, of enough severity to get on um, to a syndromic surveillance sort of catchment that then will say there's something unusual going on. So effectively using the population as sentinels 
Um, and we should be detecting outbreaks well in advance of that. So, so hoping um, that we can all work together from, so for this sort of future scenario, I've been recently had the good fortune to work with a lot of engineers and computer scientists and data scientists around how we can integrate this sort of this new technology, some of which has just recently come about and even further much more from the pandemic um, and how we can integrate that into surveillance for emerging um, effects. For um, one more thing I wanted to just show, show is similar as was mentioned in the last session and very well highlighted by Dr. Bailey right now is that we really need to think about these participatory approaches or citizen science and the natural feedback loop that that's going to have between our ability to detect change on the landscape and then bring that back to the community in a meaningful way. This has a major role to play in these future efforts. And I think we're really going to need to up our game if we're going to hope to keep pace with emerging infectious disease and inform preventive measures that eventually move us away from basically using our most at-risk communities as the first indicator of a new threat. Thank you. Uh uh, thank you, Th thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Johnson. Very, very, very timely. Um, I know that there are, are communities right now that are concerned about some uh, localized outbreaks of H5N1, uh, and uh, uh, I'm sure they could they could use some some guidance from from you and, and your team. Uh, our, our next panelist I'd like to introduce is uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Patrick Kinney. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Kinney is uh, from Boston University uh, at the Institute for Sustainable Energy and the uh, the BU School of Public Health. Uh, and so, uh, Dr. Kinney, I will turn the the floor over to you uh, for you to uh, introduce yourself further and uh, and give a little bit of perspective. Thanks very much, Patrick, and thanks to the organizers for including me in this in this uh, meeting today. I really enjoyed. Uh, hearing the different perspectives over the course of the day to, to the extent that I've been able to join uh, some of the sessions and, and the, the, the uh, breadth and diversity of the current session is, is a good example of that. Um, I'm going to say a few words about my, my own journey towards climate and health. Um, I was trained as an air pollution epidemiologist um, back in the 1980s. Um, I was worked on something called the Harvard Six Cities Study, um, which um, was published, sort of the main results of that study were published in 1993. And there was another subsequent study called the American Cancer Society cohort study um, of air pollution that was published a couple of years later. Both of those studies pointed to uh, this new pollutant PM 2.5 um, as being really critically important in terms of uh, um, long-term exposures causing life shortening. Um, and it led fairly rapidly in, in the 1990s to the development of, of the first PM 2.5 standard, which came out in 2000. Um, and, you know, it really has kind of underpinned our understanding of air pollution health effects ever since in terms of the burden of disease. And interestingly, I was thinking back and I remember giving a talk back in 1995, where I said something like, you know, we know enough now about the health effects of air pollution to take action. We don't really need to do any more epidemiology. We, you know, we need to do research on which particles are responsible, which components. That's really a question best suited for toxicology. Like, I thought the epidemiologists were kind of done. Now, that was sort of naive and aspirational to say, um, and it certainly hasn't been the case that we, you know, people stop doing air pollution epidemiology in the meantime. But my own, my own interest started to sort of look elsewhere. I started looking for new challenges where I could apply my environmental epidemiology skills. And um, I turned in two directions. One was towards global air quality, because obviously there were still a lot of big air quality problems around the, around the, the world, uh, even if the United States was on track to cleaning up its air. Um, Africa was an emerging place where air pollution was completely unregulated. China was really bad in India. So I started doing research in those places. But I also started, um, I had the, the opportunity to start doing research on climate change around the turn of the millennium. Um, I was at Columbia University at that time, um, and um, I had the good fortune to come into contact with people from the Goddard Institute for Space, the group that uh, Kate Marvel works at. She gave a really compelling talk earlier today in this session, in the early in the morning session about um, the science of climate change. And some of her her colleagues um, back at at GIS. Um, uh, approached me about uh, doing sort of an integrated assessment of climate change impacts. And I thought it would be interesting to look at the health impacts of climate change. Um, 
it was an issue that the environmental health community really hadn't engaged with. Um, and yet it was a looming threat that looked really important. Um, and um, so, um, you know, I connected with those folks and we started looking at how we can combine their physical science knowledge at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. They do, they, they're one of the leading groups that does climate modeling um, in the world, uh, you know, sort of projecting future impacts of, of human activities on climate change. Um, we started looking at how to connect their models to an epidemiologic tools and models uh, to try to project how climate change uh, could could impact uh, air quality and, and act, impact public health in the future, initially through the air quality pathway that I already knew so well, but also looking at things like extreme heat, uh, pollen, and, and other risk pathways, um, of, of which uh, we'll probably get a chance to talk more about. And that experience working uh, in climate change has sort of led me to um, to sort of three main lessons that I just wanted to throw out there. And um, I think some other insights might come up in the discussion, but here are three, three of the insights that I've come to appreciate uh, through that work. First of all, to tackle the health impacts of climate change, we really need to expand um, the scope of what we think of as environmental health, sort of away from just the molecular scale, which is sort of traditionally the way a lot of environmental health research has been focused, to start to forge stronger links with the sciences like the atmospheric sciences, the social sciences, um, ecology, uh, policy, uh, and you know, community engagement. Um, and these are domains that historically really haven't been thought of as falling under environmental health, but they're critical to really solve this problem. Secondly, unlike with air pollution or chemical exposure generally, which, you know, which is what I was trained to understand, we don't have an easy regulatory solution uh, you know, we can't, we don't set a standard for temperature or for coastal storms or wildfires. They're going to be happening and we have to, we have to figure out like where they're happening, who they're going to be affecting and how to, how to protect those people. Um, so we have to sort of, you know, use different tools to try to reduce risks rather than just going after the chemical that we've always been able to do in the past. But we also need to pr promote solutions. Um, that reduce carbon emissions uh, and reduce climate change over the long run and as as Kate mentioned earlier today, many of those carbon neutral solutions, those, those carbon reduction solutions bring really immediate and local health benefits, especially through improved air quality, but also through other pathways. And then finally, my third point is that really the, to be most impactful, it really requires partnerships that involve academic research researchers along with public health practitioners in city and local governments, as well as community organizations to put their heads together and to work on really the tangible, the, the really on the ground problems that really are being faced at the local level. Um, and we, you know, I've been fortunate working in New York City and now in Boston uh, with, with local uh, practitioners to, to, to truly try to you know, address some of the climate challenges that are emerging. Things like um, you know, spring pollen uh, risks that are getting earlier and longer, uh, things like heat waves and where the heat vulnerability is greatest and where we can sort of target our our resources to be most effective. I'm going to stop right there and then hope, hope to be able to participate in the further discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kinney. Um, you, you, you mentioned something that's that's been kind of a, a reoccurring theme uh, that uh, I, I hope we can come back to in the, in, in the discussion uh, uh, regarding this this definition. You know, how, how do we define environmental health? Kind of where do we set the where do we set the boundaries of that scope? Um, it's something that uh, I'm hoping that uh, Dr. Johnson can weigh in on as from a, from one health perspective, and then uh, also tomorrow morning we have uh, we have some 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 leaders from various uh, uh, public health and adjacent organizations that uh, are going to uh, uh, help help to, to give some insights on uh, on how they're thinking about the definition of that in uh, in, in neighboring uh, neighbor, neighboring fields of study. So with, with that, uh, I want to uh, introduce uh, our, our final of our four panelists, uh, Dr. Nataki osborne Chelks. Uh, Dr. Uh, osborne Chelks is an uh, assistant professor in uh, environmental health sciences at Spelman College in Atlanta and a member of the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council. So uh, Dr. osborne Chelks, uh, I'll, I'll hand it to you. Thank you so much for, um, for that introduction, and thank you to the organizers of the session for the invitation to share. Um, so I'll, I guess, kind of start as others have started and talk a little bit about my path um, in environmental health. And really, um, 
I, I started off um, studying uh, engineering, um, but began to quickly understand, um, well, one, how engineering, uh, environmental engineering in particular, you know, contributes to health, but I got really interested in looking at environmental health issues um, after really um, just, you know, recognizing um, some of the challenges in some of the places where I grew up. Um, I spent a part of my childhood in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, and in what some people call the Cancer Alley Corridor, um, and, you know, just understood the realities of living in close proximity to uh, a petrochemical uh, facility, um, also making some anecdotal, you know, op some observations, I should say, about uh, my experience. The pollution index was always high. Uh, the air smelled bad. The water smelled and tasted bad. Um, and then in terms of, you know, health issues, my own personal health issues, as well as um, health issues issues of, of family members. It wasn't that I could connect um, what we may have been exposed to to uh, those diagnoses and, and the things that we experienced, but really just the fact that that possibility existed um, was what got me engaged in doing uh, and studying uh, and, and uh, being involved uh, in environmental health work. Um, so what I'd like to kind of lift up uh, does build upon uh, what a couple of our uh, previous speakers have already said, um, but maybe I can sort of put my own spin on it uh, just a bit. Um, when, if I can just lift up, and I took some notes here, um, Dr. Bailey talks about um, both intersectionality and interdisciplinary, uh, inter interdisciplinarity. And so um, those are, are two um, terms that I think are important uh, from my perspective uh, on this work and the future of this work. Uh, in particular, I am very interested in cumulative risks and impacts. Um, when I think about things from an environmental justice frame, and that often is the frame that I am using based on um, my lived experience growing up and even uh, where I live in the city of Atlanta, uh, where communities, uh, neighborhoods, specific neighborhoods in Atlanta Anna, um, you know, we can talk about a number of different characterizations, but we can talk about uh, the uh, effects of exposure to extreme heat, and we can talk about soil and water contaminants, air pollution, um, issues around water quality, um, etc. And the challenge, however, is that um, these communities don't have one single stressor. There isn't one single set of exposures. Um, there are chemical exposures, non-chemical stressors and exposures as well. And so I think we have to re really look a lot more at um, combined risk, uh, looking at environmental hazards, but then also looking at the interplay of social vulnerability and how that impacts the health of groups that are already vulnerable. Um, and when we think about uh, climate change um, and how these same populations will experience changes now in those chemical exposures, as well as changes in social vulnerability, um, there is the potential for there to be an exacerbation of negative health impacts. Um, and so I think that there is an urgent need for us to understand you know, how climate, environment, and social, social vulnerability uh, interact um, to affect health. Um, and this is really of particular concern for individuals that have have uh, increased susceptibility due to pre-existing health conditions, um, things such as asthma, maybe mental health challenges, um, obesity sensitive conditions, et cetera. Um, the other thing that I would mention uh, in, in addition to looking a lot more at cumulative risk and impacts and looking at this interplay of um, chemical stressors and non-chemical stressors, um, I, I, and I'll add in, in that in terms of the non-chemical stressors, we can also think about, you know, some of the hyperlocal impacts of climate change like flooding, um, which might bring contaminants um, with it. But, you know, there are a lot of uh, other challenges associated with things like, you know, flooding. And we're seeing um, that quite a bit, especially uh, not just in coastal areas, but also in urban areas, which is where I tend to do my work. Um, and so really looking at these things over the life course or lifespan um, is, is really important, I believe. The other, um, I think, opportunity that we have um, with respect to, to looking at a path forward, especially in the context of climate change and um, bringing the climate change analysis into the traditional work um, that is done in environmental health, I'd like to echo um, what um, was just said um, by uh, Dr. Kinney in terms of thinking about 
about, you know, even things like community engagement um, and how important that is. Um, and not just community engagement, really working not only with, you know, um, local uh, government agencies, not only working with public health practitioners, but working with community residents and those community-based organizations who can um, be uh, collaborators in the research that we need to get done. Um, my work tends to um, focus a lot, or at least increasingly uh, lately, on uh, community science initiatives. You know, how can we get community residents engaged in helping to collect data that we hope will be actionable data um, that we can use to press for, um, you know, different uh, changes, you know, systems change, policy change, social change. Um, you know, how can we, you know, uh, look at public health practice in a different way? Um, look at the management of our natural resources in a different way based on that actionable data. Uh, and then how can we look at the policy change that is also needed? Um, so I just wanna emphasize that you know, lived experience, local community knowledge that community residents have, I think is critical to adding that um, as a part of the equation uh, to how we address these issues. Um, and you know, really looking at the capacity that community residents and community-based organizations have um, to help collect that on the ground, you know, street level data uh, in, you know, localized areas, which I think can help to fill in some important gaps when we are trying to not only understand what the environmental conditions are, but how that is impacting the health of those populations as well. And I'll stop and pass it back over to Patrick. Thank you very much, Dr. Osborne Jokes. I, you know, I think that uh, you're you know your your discussion on the, the community based work and uh, your your experience activating uh, citizen science uh, uh, apparatus in in Atlanta and other other places. I think that's I think that's something that we want to drill into a little bit more in this uh, in this uh, in this panel discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Osborne Jokes. I you know I think that uh, your you know your your discussion on the, the community based work and uh, your your experience activating uh, citizen science uh, uh, apparatus in in Atlanta and other other places i think that's i think that's something that we want to drill into a little bit more in this uh, in this uh, in this panel discussion so uh, with that i'm going to introduce the, the the scenario that we have uh, uh, set set out and uh, just uh, I'm digging it for myself here and uh, uh, again this is a session on, on the intersection between uh, climate change and health and and how we can use the tools we have in hand and the tools that we expect to emerge over the next 10 years uh, to make decisions that are that are responsible for uh, for, for, for both of those situations and, and, and triaging uh, possible activities possible research directions possible community actions uh, based on uh, the, the way that climate change uh, and, 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 and health interacts. So the scenario is that the U.S. is budgeting $1 billion nationwide for community-driven initiatives to help address climate change and related health issues. A governor's meeting is convened to determine how to allocate $1 billion to communities across the U.S. Scientists and community leaders have gathered to present data on the impact of severe weather events, including wildfires impacting air quality, uh, and probably informed by data using uh, real-time air pollution monitoring, uh, severe drought and the impact on farmers and rural communities, flooding and extreme winter storms. So we've we've heard a lot from from, from Kate Marvel and and, and others uh, through, throughout the day about uh, about, about the, the intersection between uh, the, the 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 environment and, and climate and, uh, and 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 health concerns. Um, and uh, what, one question uh, that, uh, that I want to start with, with this group, is what are the major actions that we could be taking now to minimize the impact of climate change? And I, I'm particularly interested in kind of the, the, the specifics, but also kind of the, what's, the, what's the rationale for, for, for making those selections, right? If you've got kind of the, the universe of things you could do, um, uh, I mean, doc, Dr. Johnson, you, you you spoke to to some uh, uh, so, some of the impacts from from an ecological perspective. Uh, so, uh, in terms of intervention along the the ecological perspective versus the uh, uh, community based uh, health uh, health outcomes, 
uh, disease concerns versus property damage, uh, local versus uh, versus uh, regional and global. Like how, do, how do we decide where to where to invest these resources, um, and what do we need to to develop over the next ten years, from from a science perspective and from 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 an institutional decision making perspective that would help us to to determine what how to use the money best. Over, over to me first. Okay. Go ahead. Happy to go at it. I think my colleagues will have a lot to say on that front, but I guess um, certainly the case has been made around early climate action and that there's going to, and the case was reiterated this morning, that there's going to need to be a period of adaptation while we witness warming as well as these very adverse sort of disaster um, oriented um, situations that are going to be um, really driving sort of not just our health, but I think environmental health in general. I feel one thing, one perspective that that I think of in terms of how to integrate across a more broader set of disciplines is to really think about the environment and ecosystems as sort of providing an ecosystem service. And we know um, that it provides a service around air quality and, and water quality and Similarly, we know that, that it provides a service around climate regulation. And I think one thing that climate science has really done is to highlight how far we have really gone off the rails in terms of what we expect to be normative patterns and the disease risks um, from my own sort of specialized perspective are, are similarly um, sort of going off the rails in that way with, with the likelihood for increasing risk around disease emergence and even just the normal regular infectious diseases that we know to go side by side with some of these big climate disasters that are in the scenario um, that we're proposing right now. So I think there has been innovation, technological innovation in the space. Um, a lot of it has been directed in terms of human health and now is the time to really bridge those disciplines to spread sort of the wealth of those innovations, those technological innovations out towards um, animal health, because we know that that can't be left behind. We know that that is important um, in terms of understanding environmental change, but also zoonotic disease risk, which is a big part of um, a consequence of climate change going forward. But also um, we need those, those same sort of new innovations to, to bring us to a better understanding of what has changed in the environment, what is different on the landscape, and specifically when we have more localized changes on the landscape that we can understand better through sensors and ways of remote data collection um, and things that have, have started to emerge, um, how can we then tie that to an evidence base that's ultimately going to be needed for policy? Thank you. Anybody else have thoughts on uh, on how how we would be making uh, make making these decisions of prioritization? I'll, I'll just it, jump in for yeah. a second, and then I think Karen might want to say something too. Um, uh, yeah, that was that was an interesting set of points, Christine. Um, I just wanted to say that you know, climate the the pathways that link climate change to health are are quite complex, and 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 they're very like place specific. Uh, if we're talking about extreme heat. You know, we st we start to think more about like cities and the heat island and 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 who's living in those cities and who has housing and resources to protect themselves from heat or not. Um, so that would be like a priority. If you're thinking about coastal storms, then it's like obviously it's the coastlines, it's the low lying areas. Again, it's like which people are in living in dwellings that are near the coastline that that are um, most vulnerable or that have the fewest resources for sort of getting away when they need to. Um, so th my point is that it's very um, pathway specific. Sort of the it's a complex question that you're asking, Patrick, and the answer is is also complex, and it, it really needs to be divided up into these different sort of silos. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, let others weigh in. Yeah, I think you you, you brought up some really great points there, Dr. Kinney, and I think kind of expanding on that is the importance of usable and actionable and really empowering data. And if we're thinking about these communities um, that might be sort of frontline communities or, more, or exposed to compound hazards or cumulative effects or sort of all these terms that, that talk about sort of the myriad of ways people are exposed to um, risk as a result of both environmental you know, hazards and then also climate change, right? We think about the need for often in some places where there is a more vulnerability, 
where there might be a history of marginalization, the need for collective action, right? And so if we're thinking about how to engage communities in that collective action, providing and asking questions about what type of data is actionable and what type of data is empowering, right? And not just sort of adding to the myriad of data sets that already exist out there that feel separate or at a non-relevant scales or sort of not most closely linked to what's, what's on people's minds on a day-to-day -day basis, but sort of conducting research and engaging with communities in ways that does make the data usable, actionable, and empowering for decision-making, for collective action, for individual action. Um, and, 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 you know, I think often about collective action, particularly for um, vulnerable communities. Uh, so I'm thinking about all the, the different ways that data can be um, improved and sort of its accessibility and relevance. I could just add um, just a couple of quick things to that really to build on what um, Karen was just mentioning. Um, when you talk about that data that's usable, that's actionable, that's empowering, I, I want to point back to um, really the utility of engaging the community in an, in an authentic way. Um, you know, we've also heard um, someone else said, I can't remember who said it um, just a minute ago, that these things are very contextualized, they're very place-based. And so really engaging those communities is, is important. Um, I also think that um, as we look at a lot of the technical issues around climate change, um, that we can't forget to look at these intersecting issues of social vulnerability. Um, when we talk about the impacts of climate change, you know, we're all impacted, obviously, you know, we're all uh, in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. You know, some communities are a lot more vulnerable. That vulnerability is not innate to who they are. It's not in their DNA per se, um, but there have been policies that have been um, implemented that have increased the vulnerability of certain populations and communities. And so we've got to lift that up as well um, um, and, and make sure that as we are thinking about solutions, we're thinking about those communities, those populations that are most vulnerable. And if we can um, really begin to address um, these issues for them, both on a, you know, let's slow down, you know, and kind of turn turn the clock around uh, on climate change, but also in terms of the adaptation space, uh, then, then that is going to bode well for all of us. Um, but we've got to not forget those who are most vulnerable. Dr. Johnson? Oh, I just wanted to take a minute to jump in on that, those exact last few points actually that were made really eloquently around the need for community-based um, sort of integration into the research effort. And it was made a bit in the last, um, the last sort of session that we had um, that was very much based on environmental justice and focused on that. Um, and it was brought up then the, the issues that we have around misinformation and and it was definitely alluded to, and I think important to just bring up again within the context of this scenario that engaging the communities and the citizens in the early aspects of the research, as we're, as we're saying, these are really complex and also very locally specific problems that are going to be need to be assessed locally and in, involving sort of the community at the time that the research gets started engaging them all along the way and then bringing back sort of what are the research findings so that they are part of the process I think could go a really long way towards that um, that issue around misinformation and people actually wanting to take action actually understanding the reasons for action feeling that they're confident in the evidence base and ultimately that um, having a much better trajectory for for uptake of mitigation that's going to you know of course it's going to take effort. Um, to change some of these trends. So um, so I think that, as everyone is saying, is how we get the buy-in. So I, I'm, I'm hearing uh, uh, a repeated theme that, uh, that's regardless of what the actions are that, uh, that, that, that we decide to take with our, with our million dollars, there needs to be uh, a consideration at the committee level and a better integration of, the, of voices at that level. Um, if that's... Uh, if that is going to be uh, true 10 years from now, um, as it probably is today, uh, what, what, what would have to change to, to be able to bring uh, those community groups to the table uh, to, 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 to empower them with the, uh, with, with the, with the, with the information as, as 
uh, as, as, as Dr. Johnson was just uh, 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 describing, um, and then, but also empowering them with kind of the organizational tools to uh, to to integrate that information and uh, advocate uh, on the, on their own behalf uh, and, and be heard. Uh, um, you know, when, when you're when you're talking about prioritization of of, mo of money available at kind of a federal level, uh, it's easy, I, I imagine, for the community to, uh, to to get lost in that. So, what what would need to change in in, in how we uh, how, how, how we how we organize decision making processes so uh, uh, you know that those 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 communities that are most affected and that need it the most uh, would 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 uh, feel like they they were empowered to get those resources. Jumping here with a with a couple of thoughts, I think one is and there's a growing number of these that I think have been discussed and established that aren't necessarily um, uh, well adhered to but sort of norms of engaging with of, of government engagement with uh, indigenous communities or local communities, for example, right? These are, there are documents that have been drafted that, um, you know, leaders and, and politicians and decision makers have agreed to that say, we're, when we talk to these communities, we're going to engage them in this way. When we talk to these groups, we're mm -hmm. going to engage them in this way, and we're going to ensure that they're valued in the process. Um, and I think we need to make, make people more aware that those documents this, but and also encourage adherence, adherence to them so that those voices can be valued in ways that they haven't. Um, also very selfishly, sort of in a different direction, as an early career scholar in an academic setting, we also need to value research that does that in a meaningful way. I talk a lot about sort of how, um, as an academic at a university, I have judged sort of by, you know, grants and publications, largely in addition to my teaching, and, and those don't necessarily value whether or not a community acted on research that I conducted or whether or not decisions were made or whether or not you know, people came together and came up with a solution. And we need to value that type of work and empower it amongst academics who are you know, often in, in the trajectories towards this type of research. Um, so I think both that kind of in the government sector and, and sort of the way municipalities think about making decisions, how they engage with communities, and then also how we train and encourage academics to engage with communities is really important. Great points, Karen. Uh, Patrick, over to you. Yes, yes, thanks. Um, I just wanted to point out that um, I think we have a model for how how this could be done in the climate research context. Um, actually, a, a model that NIEHS uh, pioneered 15 or 20 years ago when Kenneth Olden was the director of NIEHS, um, and he instituted the Environmental Justice Grant Program and also the um, Community-Based Participatory Research uh, funding program. So, you know, money was direct, research money was directed um, at environmental health problems that um, where community members and academics work together to to try to solve the problems and do the research and generate the data. In the process of, of you know, funding those studies, a whole lot of um, community capacity was built. Um, for example, an organization that I was working with back in those days, West Harlem Environmental Action, was just starting out and they have you know, become a real powerhouse organization in part because of that early funding that came from NIEHS under that program. Um, I think that kind of model, um, you know, if, if there were a billion dollars or even you know, less than a billion dollars, but some of that was, be, was, was allocated for a community-based participatory research kind of program on climate and health, I think that could be really powerful in terms of building that capacity. And at the same time, generating the research data that we need to actually take action. Great. Yeah. No. Uh, I mean, a big, uh, a big, a big piece of why we're we're, we're convening this group is is to is to identify where where groups like an AHS could, uh, could 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 make that impact. So um, you know, the fact that they've they've tread that ground before is, is something that we we will will definitely uh, be wanting to highlight with them. Dr. Osborne Jelks. So Dr. Kenny actually said uh, several things that I was going to touch upon. So if I could maybe add a couple of things um, to, to grow that conversation just a little bit. Um, you know, what I was definitely thinking when you posed the question is that it's about building capacity, um, building capacity for communities and community-based organizations. And I don't think it's about empowering them, but it is about setting the conditions so that they can empower themselves. And so access to resources is really important. Um, being able to access, you know, dollars, 
um, grant dollars um, to work, you know, uh, collaboratively with academics and public health, you know, practitioners and others, um, that is really critical um, because I do think that there is a lot that can be done, you know, at that community scale, at that community level um, to generate the data that we need to help um, help us to, you know, address and to explore some of these really complex comp complex problems, excuse me. Um, so that really is, is a critical piece of it. Um, and I think, you know, looking within, you know, all of the funding mechanisms um, is going to be important um, across different types of federal agencies. So not just NIEHS, you know, EPA and others, a lot of uh, groups, environmental justice communities in particular, tend to work a lot with EPA just because they have a division of environmental justice and have grant funding. But in the past, most, most of that funding has been really at the small grants level. You know, we're talking 25000 maybe $30,000 level. And really, I think there is a, a need now um, for larger levels of funding for community-based organizations. And there have been some, you know, particular programs that did allow for a larger um, amount, you know, of funding. But, you know, those, you know, programs were sunset or, you know, they didn't happen on a very consistent basis. And so I know that there is work happening now to change that, um, to change, you know, the, the value of small grants. Um, but that really, I think, is important because you can't expect, you know, community-based groups and, and others, quite honestly, to really work on these systemic level problems by, you know, accessing uh, non-renewable, you know, one-year grants. Um, we're just not going to get where we need to get fast enough if that is the only model that we have to, um, through which we can access those funding dollars. So a, a, a very, uh, very, very germane uh, question from the from the audience. Uh, uh, follow, following on on your comments, Dr. Osborne Shell, so I'll give you a chance to respond to it, and then uh, uh, Dr. Johnson, uh, if, if you'd like to as well. Uh, as previously discussed, community engagement takes time to develop trust and relationships. It is one thing for funding agencies to support existing relationships that have been built, but how can funding agencies foster creation of new relationships? and then subsequently foster their success over the longer term. In the, in the current funding process, it's difficult to get a good score and get funded unless you already have a pre-existing relationship because it's too risky to invest in something new. Uh, Dr. Osborne jokes, I think you, 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 touched, on, uh, you touched on that point. Uh, any, anything else to add? The only thing that I would add is that, you know, where there is the potential to include some time for that cultivation, you know, of relationships uh, in the grant, you know, making process, I think that would be critical. And granted, you know, you can't always put, you know, a time parameter around, you know, what it takes to develop, you know, a solid relationship. Um, but, you know, um, because, you know, I often say that, you know, these relationships kind of move at the speed of trust. But if there is that time, especially in terms of some of the, the funds, uh, funding that I've seen come out of, you know, NIH or NIHS, when they have, you know, dealt with, you know, community-based participatory research, um, you know, there, there is, you know, some, there could be some time um, dedicated to, you know, making sure that, you know, community uh, and the researchers are kind of ground truth in what it is that they're going to work on. Obviously, you come, you know, with certain ideas, but maybe you don't have everything fully baked. Um, and along with that time to get things fully baked, you know, how about um, including, you know, maybe a first year at least, you know, um, in, in terms of an opportunity for relationships to develop further, you know, there still might need to be some connection that's already been made, you know, it may not be able to be something that's completely cold, but, you know, it takes time to develop those relationships. And so, you know, sometimes what's already been invested can be deepened, can be expanded, you know, if there were time within that funding horizon to allow for that to happen. Yeah, absolutely. And to uh, Dr. Bailey's point earlier, if there were incentives at the institutional level for, for, for pursuing those kinds of uh, activities. Um, uh, doc, Dr. Johnson, did you have anything you wanted to add on that? You had your hand up before uh, on uh, Oh, it was, I think it was uh, it's somewhat unrelated. I would leave all the ideas around community engagement um, and sort of the level of discussion now to the social scientists, because certainly I've learned so much from them on, on how to do that well. Awesome. Um, the, so I, I guess probably as much as I'm enjoying the, 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 the drill, drilling in at this level, we should we should take a step back um, and and coming back to the original scenario. 
uh, intersection of, uh, of, of, of health and, and, and climate change. Uh, what, what, what should we be considering in terms of health impacts uh, to, to measure impacts of, of, of climate change? And uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Kinney, I'm, I'm particularly interested in, uh, in, in your thoughts with your experience with, with PM 2.5 and, and things like that. Um, you know, how as, as, uh, as the uh, molecular diagnostic and the exposomic uh, landscape has, uh, has, has, has evolved, um, you know, what should we be looking at in terms of health outcomes uh, and, and maybe even uh, biomarkers of stream of health outcomes to, uh, to understand the intersection between the, between the, the uh, environmental uh, climate change and, and health? That's, that's another hard, hard question that you've, you've posed. Um, and, you know, in my experience, um, and I'd be interested what others think about this, but I, I haven't found um, as much value in the tr sort of traditional biomolecular kinds of approaches in, in, the, in the climate change context as, as has been so helpful in the sort of chemical exposures context. Um, it, it's much more, I'm sorry about some background noise here, it's much more um, a focus on kind of the community scale and, and sort of um, larger scale interactions between, you know, human activities and the, the climate, the earth sciences, um, the ecology, and, and sort of sort of at that sort of out of body scale that seems to be kind of like the questions that are most important. Um, but in terms of, you know, how do we prioritize uh, what kind of science is going to be most needed? Um, I think I think it's kind of, you know, all of the above because, um, again, because climate change and, it, and its health impacts are so multi-dimensional. Um, so, you know, I think I think it's such a big field that we, you know, we're gonna we're gonna need to think about sort of dividing it up into there's the vector-borne disease approach, you know, that that whole set of questions which are really important, um, you know, mosquitoes that are expanding their range and you know the whole all the science of how how to do that and how to deal with that. There's the air pollution connections that I that I work on a lot. Um, um, you know, climate makes air pollution worse, but uh, air pollution is like, you know, is really what's responsible for climate change in a sense, at least, you know, the carbon emissions that were, so, you know, solving the car, the climate problem is also going to help us solve the air pollution problem, which, which actually presents tremendous opportunities. Um, some of the extreme events that we have less control over, like heat waves, uh, coastal storms, wildfires, um, those are things that are, you know, becoming more existentially threat threatening in the sense that, you know, we don't have easy fixes. And I'm not sure what the what the right science is. Um, you know, I'm not sure if it's it's sort of molecular biology or toxicology. It's maybe it's more about just understanding sort of spatial vulnerability. I guess I'm I'm rambling, so I'm going to stop rambling and and turn it over to others who have insights about about this hard question that you've posed. Other thoughts, Dr. Dr. Johnson, you highlighted in your introductory remarks. Uh, that uh, that a lot of times we are uh, very very reactive to the way we we approach, uh, for instance, zoonotic uh, 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 infections. Uh, you know, we wait we wait and see. You know, we wait for a bunch of people to get sick, uh, and then we and then we then we backtrack. Uh, and uh, I, I'm wondering if that's um, I mean, maybe it, maybe that's our best indicator um, is people getting getting sick but you know I, I would I would love to see 10 years from now something that would be a little bit more uh, uh, predictive um, any 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 thoughts on what that could look like dr. Johnson we don't have your audio. How's that? Sorry. Yep, we got you back. Good. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I I agree with the comments that were just made um, by by Patrick on the idea that we need to have emerging science um, at the local level to really inform. But we have, you know, case studies where we, you know, once we know about a threat, where we can move towards early indicators either in the environment or even in animal populations. And I think back to the really early days of West Nile virus when that was newly emerging in the US and 
it was, you know, first evident in animal populations, and then, you know, the connection was made between the animal and human health, where information was shared, and then it was recognized as a as a human threat. And then what what came out of that for for a good long period was a pretty effective way of engaging the communities around recognition of an early threat, where there was I don't know if anyone else remembers, but there was the whole dead bird program. And if you see a dead bird in your mm -hmm. community, um, you call the hotline. And I think that was a very effective way to give community members information that there is an outbreak of an infectious disease, um, as well as tell them, you know, something that they, that they could do about the situation. And I think, um, and it also was a impor really important source for surveillance and for public health entities to be able to gauge um, where there were hot spots and where um, where there needed to be more risk mitigation on the mosquito side. And I think that's a pretty um, prominent example now because we know West Nile is something that does is expected to ha to be another problem, increasingly so with with climate change. Definitely, the mosquitoes um, are likely to put people at more risk with warming trends, um, given how that the warm um, weather affects their life cycle. And so, um, and certainly wet weather. Um, and so, I think that's that's a, that's a good example of of a way forward um, for for sort of the case study. Um, back. Back to your question, though. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Osborne Jokes. You've, you've had a, a lot of experience with uh, with uh, with activating citizen science and uh, community-based uh, research research efforts. Um, you know, are there, um, are there are there are there there things that we could be doing to uh, support those efforts? Not every community has has you. Um, so what uh, what what do we need to do to uh, to 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 make programs like that uh, and, uh, work, and to be able to provide actionable data like what uh, Dr. Johnson just talked about with the uh, with the you know the bird 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 identification and, and reporting reporting things like that. Um, what what would you like to see in place uh, you know ten years from now in terms of uh, institutional support for for those kinds of activities? Thank you. Great question. Um, well, I'd like to see maybe a couple of different things. One, direct support of community-based organizations who um, are doing this work. And so Dr. Kenny talked a little bit about We Act for Environmental Justice, as they're now called, um, in in um, West Harlem and, you know, how they have completely, um, the, you know, they are now, you know, a huge powerhouse, um, such, so much so that they're not only making huge impacts in their own community, um, but they are helping to support and resource and build capacity with other um, community-based organizations across the country. So having that direct access to funding, I think is going to be critical. You know, maybe, um, you know, just as in some RFPs, you know, there may be academic institutions and others who, you know, have to be the primary uh, applicants for those funds, but there might be a requirement that, you know, they're working with the community. Um, and so perhaps, you know, there's funding available now for these community-based organizations, but, you know, um, there's this encouragement of that collaboration with academics or others, um, you know, to bring some other pieces of the puzzle together. Um, that, I think, would be um, helpful. Uh, even, you know, greater opportunities for... Um, for you know, uh, academic institutions, since I am with an academic institution, um, as we work with community-based organizations uh, on collaborative funding, um, you know, there there is a model that some agencies have had. Uh, NSF is one of those agencies where, when they have um, maybe a large organization, research one institution partnering with a smaller, uh, maybe a historically black college or um, a minority serving institution, there are some avenues where there are almost kind of like two threads of funding that go through that one um, grant. So the the smaller entity doesn't have to be just a sub awardee. Um, but they kind of get their own, you know, budget and, you know, opportunity for, you know, um, 
you know, the direct, uh, indirect cost and, and all of those things, just, you know, just as the academic institutions do. And that um, kind of creates a situation for more parity, I think, in terms of, you know, what those community-based organizations are able to get access to. And it, you know, it may be that their budgets might never be, you know, quite the size of some of these academic institutions, but um, this might uh, alleviate um, some of the capping that tends to happen, um, you know, when you just kind of go this route of, you know, big institution working with the community, you know, there's a sub award. And a lot of times, you know, a lot of that funding gets, you know, eaten up by, you know, indirects and overhead costs, you know, from those larger institutions, you know, so how can we, you know, sort of raise that cap? Um, so I, I say all that to say funding, you know, um, will help to um, help those community based organizations to build capacity. Um, if we're talking about really investing in some of this, you know, community based work, citizen and community science work, um, then, you know, those institutions that are on the ground working with communities have to have access to the funding just as, as, um, just as the academic and research institutions do. Great thoughts. I hope uh, some of these uh, questions come up uh, uh, again tomorrow when we've got uh, institute directors uh, on the line. Uh, Dr. Kinney, your thoughts. I just, I just wanted to have a chance to say that I, I really like this scenario because of uh, the scale of the investment, the billion dollar idea. I think that's sort of the scale of what's really needed on this, on this topic. Um, you know, we've known about the health impacts of climate change for a couple of decades, and we still don't have any kind of large coordinated federal funding source to, to do the kinds of studies that we've been brainstorming about here. Um, I think I think the um, capacity is there. I think um, you know lo lots of academic institutions have built climate and health programs over the last five years. There's a lot of um, action at the community level, as as we've heard. Um, you know, community groups are are dealing with you know they're on the front lines of the impacts of extreme heat and storms, so they're they're very aware and they're very they're very anxious to take action. Um, but you know. Cities, city governments are are mobilized, there, you know, because they're dealing with the the impacts themselves and trying to figure out how to protect their populations from future impacts. So I think like every the, the stage is set. I think an investment mm -hmm. of, of funding of this of this sort of magnitude would really would really be helpful uh, to to really start solving this problem really quickly. So so I want to I want to piggyback on that because. Um... I think that's 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 a piece of what we 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 want to we want to try to drill into here is is what right so as you mentioned stage is set you know we we understand the the relationship between the health effects and the and the, 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 the changing climate there's no question that climate is changing there's no question that it's our fault there's so so why is there not a coordinated funding source right like what's the are we missing political will are we missing you know what what's if there's something that we, what what would have to change? I think we we take the take the shackles off here, right? Like what would what would have to change over the next ten years uh, for for that to you know not be a pipe dream, right? Not, for this not to be a you know a, a, you know scenario we're discussing in a workshop. If I could go first, then I'd love to hear the other perspectives. Um, I think it's really political will, probably mostly. Um, for example, there you know. I haven't followed this too closely, but others here in this session, I'm sure, know more about it than I do. But like, in in one of the most in the recent bills that was, that the, the the government passed, uh, there was originally going to be 100 million dollars for initial climate and health research that NIH was going to figure out how to spend. I think it was zeroed out sort of at the last minute. I'm not sure why. Maybe maybe for important reasons to do, to do with Ukrainian funding or something like that. But you know there. That was the closest we've come, as far as I've seen, to actually having a program that focuses on climate and health. I think it, I think if there's political will, it could happen. I think it. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. It's 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 really important. It's for some reason it hasn't happened. I think uh, one other point is that um, the topic of climate and health, because it's so multidisciplinary, it kind of falls between the cracks of some, or the between the the silos of NIH, NSF, and EPA. It's like there's no one organization that kind of captures the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that makes it hard too. like, you know, there's the biomolecular questions that NIH is really good at. There's the sort of earth science that NSF is really good at, but it's really the intersection of those two things. So it's almost needs to be kind of like a joint program. Other thoughts? 
I would I would 100% echo what um, what Dr. Kinney just said, and that it's going to require an interagency effort that we have really not seen um, before. And then um, it's not lost on any of us, I'm sure, um, that that we tend to be uh, quite a bit worse at funding prevention and proactive measures. And for a long time, climate change sort of fell into that bucket. I think it's only sort of recently that people are starting to feel the, you know, actually witness the effects themselves of climate. And so I think, um, you know, that sort of proactive approach that that's looking long enough in the future, way beyond like the four year sort of political cycles that or two year um, that, that a lot of these things happen on is, is a pervasive problem um, that, that we, that's going to require investment. Maybe one last thing that I can add, um, and I totally agree with um, what has already been said, um, is that a lot of times, even you know, when you look at some of the climate-related funding, you know, even outside of, um, and I'll talk really outside of the context, maybe of um, federal agencies, but just in that broader ecosystem where climate change, you know, funding is happening, you either get funding that's focused on mitigation or it's focused on adaptation. Um, and you don't have a lot of funding sources that are trying to, you know, from a sol solutions perspective, look at, you know, both how we, you know, how we adapt, you know, to this changing climate, but at the same time work on measures with respect to mitigation, you know, also. Um, and so just, you know, putting that in the, in the mix, I think is also important um, as we, um, you know, hopefully there will be some efforts that eventually will, you know, and, and not, you know, too, too long from now, you know, come together uh, in which we can, you know, look at climate change and health in, in its complexity. And there be, you know, these agencies that are coming together, um, you know, through these interagency processes. Um, and, and there are examples, you know, different agencies come together and fund, you know, different types of work. I've seen it happen, you know, kind of on the conservation side and, you um, you know, that sort of thing. But, you know, what about, you know, EPA and NIH um, and NSF really coming together and looking at ways that they can, can you know, work together and, you know, fund these cross-disciplinary, um, you know, collaborative, you know, highly collaborative, you know, efforts uh, to help us to address um, the myriad of complexities that are associated with climate change um, and the way that it impacts health. That's 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 great. Um, all right, we are we are running uh, dangerously low on time here. Um, uh, we have uh, four minutes uh, until we have to pass uh, pass back uh, for the for the end of the day. Um, I, I wanted to just come back briefly to uh, a, a topic that uh, that that was raised, and that's kind of this definition of environmental health sciences. Kind of who has to be. Uh, where, where do we set the scope? I mean, we just talked about how, you know, it's not, uh, you know, allocating a, a, a billion dollars isn't any one agency's responsibility. Um, uh, Dr. Osborne jokes, you said EPA, NIH, NSF, you know, might, you know, might, might come together to, to, have, a, to have a hand in it. Uh, I mean, how, how does that, 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 that thinking and the fact that it's not, you know, currently maybe under any single agency uh, or, or, or any organization's jurisdiction, how does that how does that impact kind of how we're thinking about how we define environmental health sciences and what other disciplines we have to wrap into it? I mean, this whole this whole uh, scenario is based on kind of the bringing in kind of some of the, the climate change uh, 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 disciplinary thinking into environmental health. What are the other what are the other fields of study that uh, that are that are critical to bring in? I'll just jump in. Um, I guess from my perspective, it's what fields are not relevant. Um, it's hard to imagine. I think we need a much broader transdisciplinary approach than has ever been done before across engineering, biological sciences, and all the, the different um, elements that feed into both of those and phys physicists and chemists. And, and, um, and I think that is going to be a challenge in and of itself in that we need to partner on ways to do that effectively um, because that is a pretty new task um, that, that I think is going to be a potential, I don't want to say challenge, but more opportunity um, going forward. So, um, but over to others. 
for their perspective. Yeah, just a, a quick perspective as well. Um, I liked Christine's last slide where she had all the sort of new technologies and which, you know, I think um, really are important. Um, I've seen it in my own field of at least the air pollution epidemiology field over the last decade, but satellite remote sensing of air pollution from space has almost revolutionized the field, you know, in terms of, you know, defining exposures at the ground level to PM, both for risk assessment, but also for epidemiology. Like now people are doing these nationwide epidemiology studies or even global studies that rely on these, these remote sensing tools that just weren't available or at least hadn't been figured out how to utilize in the, in the past. So I think um, this again points to the, the way environmental health science is, ex is expanding beyond what we traditionally thought of as sort of the narrow confines of the field. And it's, I'm sure that will continue. Are we, how, how are we feeling about kind of as, you know, uh, you know, this, this group of, of thought leaders sees that definition of expanding Do the, do the funding agencies see it expanding, or are we missing opportunities to do, to work at the intersection of those fields because, uh, because we're too closed in our thinking? Yeah, I feel like, um, we're starting to see some changes, um, and I think that they could be accelerated just a little bit more. Um, I think folks are, are being very thoughtful, especially, at, you know, over the last couple of years, I feel like I'm seeing a lot more uh, happening that, you know, it's kind of integrating some of these things that we've talked about, you know, even kind of bringing in the social sciences, thinking about things like community engagement and how that plays a role or can play a role uh, in us addressing and looking at and exploring some of these environmental health challenges. So I know that we are out of time, so I'll I'll stop there. We are indeed. Uh, so with that, I want to I want to thank this 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 group, uh, Dr. Osborne Jelk, Dr. Johnson, and uh, Dr. Kenny, and also uh, Dr. Dr. Bailey had to had to step away. Uh, so thank you to, uh, to to the four of you, and uh, uh, we appreciate the perspective and, and look forward to, uh, to, um, to your continued engagement. Thank you. Thank you so much again to all of you. And thank you, Dr. McMullen, for that, leading that great, great, great session. Um, I just, I, there's so much that's been said, and yet there are so many common themes for today. I, I, try, I did my best to try to um, perhaps wrap this up in, in day one. Um, and hopefully we have about 15 minutes. So again, just revisioning the goal of what we were trying to accomplish today. We really wanted to look to the future um, and design a future of environmental health that's really most impactful. And we, the goal of this workshop is part of this future casting exercise that this emerging science for environmental decision making group is is charged with is really to bring an amazing is is really to broaden the number of voices who are a part of this discussion. So one of the really wonderful things, and I want to thank all of our speakers and all of our presenters today for bringing those really diverse voices to the table. So in our first vision for environmental health discussion, we had Dr. Sheets and Dr. Geller, who really helped to identify the need for more complex models to advance our understanding of susceptibility and vulnerability, um, talking about the importance of, of driving research towards better understanding of cumulative impacts to support future needs that we will be facing 10 years from now. One of the critical um, points I think that came up in this session is that we shouldn't stop decision making as research continues, but we need to um, continue this science and emerging science and the exposome and technology and tools can really understand um, and advance our understanding of vulnerability. But in order to advance this multidisciplinary perspectives are needed to really, really understand how factors intersect. And it's interesting because I think we started the day with these themes and we ended the day just now with these really critical themes as well. Um, in addition, we heard from Dr. Kate Marvel, an emerging climate scientist who set us up really well for our, our, our last session in thinking about um, understanding a vision for environmental health. We have so much data and information now to understand um, climate change and climate change impacts. Um, and so one of the things that she really talked about in her slides here is really moving towards the future and understanding what does it all mean and what does it all mean for human health. So we know that humans are causing more than 100% of observed warming and warming means more than extreme weather. Um, 
that it's really very possible. She had a hopeful message that if we act now and we act at a local scale to address some of these global issues, it is very possible to avoid the worst case scenario. Um, and so not all is not is lost, but we need action now and we need new investments towards the future um, in, in this interdisciplinary science. We moved on from there to a number of different dialogues and we had our dialogue in environmental health and precision medicine. And really this one, this discussion led off with 10 years from now, we'll have a proliferation of new exposure measurement devices available to physicians and clinicians and those working in, in medicine to really advance precision medicine. And so what do we need um, from a scientific perspective to really take advantage of these tools? Um, and what we heard again is that we need a broader representation and perspective on environmental health, particularly for underrepresented and underserved communities. We know that low-income communities are most likely to live in areas that, and are most vulnerable, not only to environmental threats, but to disasters. So this theme of climate change came out through whole, throughout the whole day. We need to think particularly in Latino X and Latinx and other um, precarious occupational and worker health scenarios that we really, those individuals are also really vulnerable. And we really need more work on translating science to advocacy and a very good place is to start this is in education and training with physicians um, and with that in mind we can get really a lot of important lessons learned from the integration of genomics into precision medicine to better understand how we train medical providers in environmental health and as these incredible tools are emerging to report information on personal exposure data back to individuals we really also need to um, better support information that will help us understand the complex biological processes and who's exposed to what in order to empower citizens to use this information at the local and community level to advance change. Um, so again, some key themes that come up again and again in each of these sessions is that multi, multi, multidisciplinary research working across diverse health topics and agencies are needed. We need um, to acknowledge more broadly in medicine and public health, the importance that environmental health impacts have. So we need science to help us understand how to, how to advance that message. Um, we really should be focusing on the next generation of researchers and encourage involvement along this theme of, of environmental health not being sort of the flavor of the day, but really a critical importance to advancing all population health and well-being. And in order to advance science, we need training in this next generation in data science. And we need communication science um, in this theme. So you can see, I, I apologize, I pulled these together really quickly, but you can see the themes that were emerging throughout the day. So we moved on to a second dialogue, similar to the first, in which we really started to look at how the exposome and this advancing technology could help support population health on a broader scale in the context of environmental justice. And some themes that emerged there is that we need to better and continue our research to better understand the role of environmental stressors, both chemical and non-chemical across the life course. In order to advance the science, we also need strong multidisciplinary, multi-agency coalitions. We need to continue this emphasis on cumulative risk and cumulative impacts. We really need to integrate the social impacts of environmental regulations in the work that we do. So what are the unintended consequences of some of our um, environmental science and work that we do? Um, on the one hand, we have all the information we need to take action. So we really need to be focusing on solutions-based research. Um, there was a really, I thought, um, important example of how omics can help in that many um, folks in a community around, um, around this, uh, hog farms down in down south in North Carolina. Um, some were trying to say that the hog farms weren't really causing the Im impact and the disease, but when you measure the microbiome in the homes, you saw the microbiome of the hogs in the microbiome in the homes of individuals who are most impacted. So we can use this technology to really advance these environmental justice issues, but we also need critical need for translational science and implementation science. We need community engagement. Um, and we need deep investment in understanding what we're measuring with the exposome. So the fact that we can measure all of these things, we really need some concerted research over the next 10 years to really understand what it all means for environmental health. Um, another theme that came out in this second session that, that really became a, a, an important theme throughout the entire day um, and was brought on, um, was identified very early on as this important need for intersectionality. And I heard intersectionality come up 
again and again with respect to interse intersectionality of disciplines, intersectionality of perspectives, inter intersectionality of um, who's most vulnerable, how we're most vulnerable, um, and really considering intersectionality and social science and, and all of the research in social science that has led us to understanding the importance of intersectionality, we need to begin to apply that to environmental health and environmental health science decision-making. So again, I was trying to take notes while also listening to that really, really rich discussion that you were having in that last session. So this is a lot. Um, but again, these themes of expanding our mental models of environmental health, the shift, the need for shifting our academic structure to um, include decision making and action oriented research as equally important and as equally as impactful in the work that we do as environmental health sciences. The new technologies can really revolutionize our evidence based thinking to address both local and global perspectives, and so we need to um, capitalize that on that as scientists. Um, we need to build, continue to build capacity and setting conditions so that communities can help themselves. Um, and we need to bring dollars into communities so that they can work collectively with diverse scientists to really make an impact. Um, and so along with that, we need to consider broader funding across multiple agencies for large scale grants. Um, and then we need to, for example, one of the big examples is maybe these new funding approaches are to bake in an initial year of relationship building across these multi multiple agencies within the funding horizon to make the work happen so that um, funding acknowledges the really important aspects of intersectionality and multidisciplinary approaches to environmental health sciences. Um, the other theme that I heard a lot in this particular session around climate change and health is that while we need to think about these issues as global climate change, and we need to think about expanding our models to include ecosystems and, and land changes into our health, a lot of the decisions for how we're going to protect populations and population health will happen at a local level. And so we need research that acknowledges investment both at the local as well as the global scale. And then we need to build political will for change. Um, and then we both, we need um, an emphasis both for particularly for climate change, both on mitigation and adaptation strategies to fund this new research. And again, we really need to have these interdisciplinary approaches. It's often hard to expand how traditional funding has happened, but we hopefully tomorrow we can, we can dive back in there again. So with that, that's sort of the recap of all of the rich and diverse information that we got from all of these amazing voices. And I want to really thank everybody for both spending the time, for those of you who are who here with us today and um, thinking about the future. And I hope that you can join us again tomorrow morning to wrap this up. We have um, our, our funding agencies who are uh, gonna be here to talk about um, environmental health sciences across the National Institute of Health. And then we have some really new emerging science voices to also talk about these issues. Um, a couple things to remember, we have a survey. So if your comments weren't provided here, there's a survey for anybody. If there are emerging questions that you would like addressed um, or considered for moving and advancing environmental health sciences forward, we'd love to hear your voices. And um, again, the more diverse voices that we have at the table, the better these future casting exercises will be moving forward. So again, thank you to everyone for being here today. I think I have wrapped things up. Um, appropriately. And um, if you, again, thank you all for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow.